Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to do a full test and review on the Mark Audio CHR120. So this is a six and a half inch uh, full range with a magnesium cone and it's relatively affordable. Um, the SD of the driver is 147 square centimeters, which is a little more than the uh, six and a half inch series from Fostex, which has an SD of 132 square centimeters. So it's kind of uh, a weird kind of in-between size category um, and that's additional to that would be the extra large outside diameter of the plastic basket and so that's always been a trait of Mark Audio. They've done some improvements to that as far as making it more, uh, more easier to accommodate into a, a baffle that's to be constructed by an enthusiast. So um, in this setup here what we've done is just simply made a walnut baffle and mounted it to the Dayton MTM 1.0 uh, cabinet that used to be available from Parts Express. I uh, bought it a number of years ago and so it's a 28 liter um, that's it, called an MTM because it's shaped such that you would typically use it in an MTM configuration. However, the Mark Audio driver simulated quite well in this cabinet volume and so I decided to use this cabinet for this driver review. So in this video what I'm gonna do is do a full set of measurements and then I'm gonna give you my listening impressions uh, on this driver. So um, let's get right to it. Um, so here we have the impedance sweep and you can see the cabinet tuning is at 40 Hertz. Um, looking at the uh, mid-range we do see a blip here which I believe is the uh, it's a mode from the surround and that's something that we see in pretty much all Mark Audio products. I don't think it's anything to be concerned about. Um, you can see in the burst decay even it's not even something that registers. So uh, moving up into the frequency range we do see breakup starting to occur in the main diaphragm starting at around 3 kilohertz. And so if we look at the raw frequency response, you can see here uh, it has a rising response coming out from the base and then it has a mid-range hump kind of centered around one kilohertz. And then we see that when we do encounter the breakup, it is quite pronounced with a 10 dB rise in the response. So that's something that uh, is pretty common with uh, metal, aluminum, magnesium drivers. And so the goal here would be to tame and damp out those breakup modes. And so we see here with the burst decay that Mark Audio has done a pretty good job of damp dampening out those resonances. And by about 12 cycles, it's pretty much gone if we're looking at a 35 dB noise floor. There is a prolonged resonance there in the upper treble, but that's uh, outside of my hearing abil ability at least. Okay, so looking at the waterfall, we just see the same results um, as the burst decay with the, with the uh, depth scale changed to milliseconds instead of cycles or periods. So it's just another way of looking at the same data. I prefer to use the burst decay because it does more correlate to our subjective, um, the subjective aspect of what we find offensive. So, so step response looks good. Uh, looking at harmonic, I started with a 85 dB test signal, and so you can see here that we're at 0.37% at 100 Hz, which is an excellent result. Um, it's mostly just up and down in the second harmonic, with the third and fourth being a being quite low at only 0.1% or lower. Okay, so 0.1% is typical of m maybe electronics. That's getting into the territory of uh, the distortion performance for electronics, particularly in the uh, treble region where amplifiers, uh, their uh, negative feedback typically will stop having an effect on lowering distortion with an amplifier. And so um, you start to see distortion rise with, with uh, in amplifiers. And so 0.1 is pretty, pretty common uh, for your average amplifier. Just something to be aware of um, that this uh, full range is approaching distortion levels commonly found with electronics. So uh, increasing the test signal to 95 dB, we see the second harmonic rise across its bandwidth, but then third and fourth harmonic remain quite low. So um, an excellent, uh, excellent, excellent bass performance. Um, uh, however, as you see, we get into the lower bass, we do see the bass uh, distortion rise, which is to be expected considering that this is just a six and a half inch uh, woofer. So um, using a multi-test 
multi-tone, multi-band signal. You can see the distortion profile. We're at minus 60 uh, dB at two kilohertz, which is a commendable result. Um, even into the upper treble, we're getting minus 67 uh, dB. So uh, an excellent result for distortion, which rivals uh, some uh, tweeters and ribbon tweeters and that. So it's it's quite a struggle to, to, to beat this number. Um, so it's uh, considering the cost factor, this is an excellent performer. If we uh, increase the samp or sorry, reduce the sampling rate to 44 kilohertz in the artist software, we're going to see a little more resolution in the bass. And so we see there that distortion is at minus 52 dB uh, with a difficult signal. Uh, increasing the test SPL to 95 dB. Uh, we see distortion still remains low at minus 50 dB. If we look at what happens in the upper treble, you can see here that overall we're not seeing a trend or a rise in the distortion uh, across its bandwidth. It's just uh, kind of at the same level with nothing really jumping out as, as an issue. Um, I wanted to show so this is something that I, I have not seen before. So I zoomed in on the test tone results and, you, and I narrowed it to just look at from 10 kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz. And so you can see these tapered columns at the base of the fundamental tones. And so I did some testing and I realized that what these are, this is the base frequencies modulating into the upper treble. And so there uh, it still remains a question as to the audibility of these artifacts that we're seeing. But if we simply assume that they're not audible, then we can look at the noise floor between the test tones, in which case it's a full minus 70 dB down. And so um, it's interesting because a lot of a lot of people in the industry, or in the hobby at least, say that full range drivers don't measure well, um, but they sound great and that's really all that matters. But what we're actually seeing here is distortion that rivals some of the best dome tweeters. And so um, it's interesting because we have a large radiating diaphragm area and it's being tasked with reproducing the treble frequencies. Now. The, dri the driver's diaphragm doesn't have to move very much compared to, for example, a dome tweeter. And so the diaphragm is barely moving uh, in order to reproduce those frequencies. And so as a result, we see very low intermodulation distortion, which is going to provide excellent clarity. So to give some comparisons, I, I went back and looked at some previous blog posts and looked at the intermodulation performance of the ViaWave ribbon tweeter. And if you scroll down and look at the IMD performance for this tweeter, we see that at 95 um, dB, sorry, even here at 90 dB, we're seeing some grass starting to show up. And it's, and it's really, you got one, two, three, four, five, you got minus 50, DB there at two kilohertz. Um, so really, even a uh, highly regarded pure ribbon tweeter um, isn't matched by the distortion that we're seeing with the Mark Audio. Now, if you wanted to go more high end and have a solution that does achieve the minus 70 DB, an example of that would be the RCF uh, compression driver that I recently reviewed where at least through the mid-range uh, we're getting minus 65 uh, at a 95 dB test SPL and so um, this is our target for sound quality is minus 65 that's our uh, in-house uh, target so the RCF is achieving that um, and so what we see here is the Mark Audio is also achieving that now with other test metrics, such as the off-axis colored polar map, what we see here is a, a relatively irregular off-axis with lots of artifacts, lots of uh, things happening in the off-axis where, um, you know, we're not going to, we we get low distortion, but there's trade-offs in this and that you have a very narrow directivity in the upper treble. Now, having said that, so we have a 40 degree listening window. It doesn't narrow very much 
beyond the 40 degree or sorry any more than uh, or any less sorry than 40 degree uh, so that's good in that sense um, but you could improve this now this was done with the driver mounted in the test baffle here which is 23 centimeters wide and so we are going to see the artifacts produced with edge diffract from edge diffraction um, in the two to three kilohertz region. So if you go with more roundovers on this baffle, then you're going to see an improvement here. So this isn't necessarily the driver that's causing this. It's simply your typical application where you're mounting the driver in a regular baffle. So what I did moving on from that, I decided to implement a baffle step correction and also a contour circuit to try to bring down that 10 dB rise in the upper treble. And so you can see here, this is what I decided on after quite extensive listening. Uh, the baffle step comprised of <clears throat> the 2.5 millihenry in the 10 ohm resistor and then the 0.47 millihenry and 6 ohm resistor for the contour circuit. And so for the contour circuit you can see here with the raw response in red and then you can see the effect of the contour circuit. We're bringing down the upper treble by about minus 3 dB just to take an edge off, kind of make it sound a little more balanced and so I found that going any further than this actually made the driver sound a little bit too dull. So adding the baffle step, you can see here we're coming in at around 600 hertz with our baffle step and providing about 4.5 dB attenuation uh, for that. And so what the result was, as you can see here, the overall response, which is relatively uh, flat, we get good base extension, and then um, we're not trying to completely eliminate this, but we're just trying to tame things to a manageable level so that the driver sounds balanced. And, and it certainly did. So after we've implemented this, the driver took on a more refined, a more rich and full sound character. So for subjective sound rating, we have 9 out of 10 for this overall sound stage depth. And for the sound stage width, we had 7 out of 10. So um, I think this is mainly attributable to the directivity that we saw in the polar map. And then this is more a factor of the low distortion. The driver was really able to bring out a lot of low level detail retrieval and we could hear very far into the sound stage with, with um, quite easily there. So for smoothness, I give it 8 out of 10. Um, the, tri the driver had a nice uh, warm character. In the upper treble, I would say that's why I gave it an 8 out of 10 and not, you know, 9. So we do have a little bit of a metallic sound coming through, which um, perceptively comes through as a little bit more edginess, a little bit more um, accentuation on you know the leading edge of transients and a little more perception or I, I would call it fake detail uh, where it's bringing out certain types of instruments a little more than they should be. So coherence between mid-range and treble I got 9 out of 10 that's more by virtue of it simply being a single point source driver. Uh, 8 out of 10 on the coherence between the mid bass and the mid range. Uh, male and female vocals, I gave it 8 out of 10 and 7 out of 10. Um, it's hard to improve that area unless you're getting into horns, um, just uh, the way that the sound is projected into the room. Uh, accurate musical timber, um, 8 out of 10 there. Uh, just It does sound very natural. Well, I wasn't getting um, any kind of enclosure resonance happening with this driver which I think is uh, mainly because the diaphragm is magnesium and so it's quite a, uh, a barrier it's a thick material rel relatively uh, compared to paper where a thin paper does transmit uh, internal cabinet resonances through the driver quite readily uh, where the magnesium has, a, has a, a good way of blocking out those internal resonances, uh, acoustical resonances inside the cabinet. So uh, sense of dynamic range, this is um, where you're really experiencing the limitation of a six and a half inch driver. Um, it does depend on the listening distance and the size of your room, uh, but in a medium sized listening room at maybe a two and a half meter listening distance, um, I was uh, getting about a 6 out of 10 for the sense of dynamic range. So overall, um, I have that the uh, Mark Audio provided a very pleasurable listening experience, and so I would certainly recommend it for those looking for full range sound on a budget. Take care and have a great day.